Yeah, and I work for the Columbia Mountains Institute along with Haley here. And CMI is a nonprofit organization whose main office is here in Revelstoke. Most of our time is spent facilitating professional development opportunities like courses and conferences for people working in the field of ecology. Um, but the CRED Talks is something special, and it is a speaker series focused mainly on science communication. And it is here to help people like you learn more about the ecological research and related projects that are taking place in the Columbia Mountains region. And topics vary. They include themes such as land management, citizen science, uh, research techniques, etc. This series is supported by the Columbia Basin Trust, so we would like to give them a big thank you. And um, we are recording these talks, so they can be accessed on our website about a week after the talk is given. Our website is cmiae.org, if you're interested. Um, in addition to the CRED talk that you'll be listening to today, next week's CRED talk will be given by Mindy Skinner, who is a resource management officer with Parks Canada. And Mindy will give an overview of the history of human impact on the summit of Mount Revelstoke. Um, including recent monitoring and planned future restoration efforts. And that's next uh, Tuesday, November the 28th at 12 p.m. Uh, but now I would like to introduce you to Sue Davies. Sue uh, joined the Columbia Shushwap Invasive Species Society called CSIS. <laughs> uh, she joined the team in April of 2017 as the Aquatic Invasive Species and Outreach Program Coordinator. And Sue comes to CSIS from previous work experience with the Invasive Species Council of BC's 2016 Revelstoke JCP crew. Uh, she also has a master's degree in ecology from New Zealand and many works, or sorry, many years work experience in the environmental and education fields. So welcome, Sue. So I have a slightly croaky voice. I hope you're going to be able to hear me. Um, thank you very much, Mia, for that uh, introduction. Today, I am going to be speaking to you about invasive species and why they matter to each and every one of us. So uh, with the Columbia Shuswap Invasive Species Society, uh, we are known as CSIS. We are not the spy agency. We're actually interested in getting our message out there rather than keeping ourselves hidden. Um, we are a network of partners. Um, we facilitate the prevention of invasive species, the reduction, and the management of invasive species um, into our area. And we do that through collaboration, through engage, engaging people, and through education, which is why I'm here today. We were established in 2013, and that was after consultation with land managers in the Columbia Shuswap region. So we're here to educate, to engage, um, and about the impacts of invasive species and about how we can actually be part of the solution in reducing those impacts. And of course, we also have established and operate uh, an invasive species management program. So we are based in the geographic region of the Columbia Shuswap Regional District, and we're one of about 17 other invasive species groups throughout BC. You can see us there as number 12. So first of all, what is an invasive species? Well, the first thing is that it's not from here. Um, the other thing is that it can be pretty much anything, an animal, a plant, um, a, a, an insect, or even a microbe. Um, and the third thing is that it, is, and it has a negative impact. So positive impact things, not necessarily invasive, but negative impact things, definitely considered invasive. So are all non-native species invasive? Well, no. Think about the tomato. The tomato is not from here. It's from South America. Um, we'd really probably quite like it if it grew a little easier for us, but in fact, it's quite challenging to make them grow and produce nice seeds and, and plants. Um, think about wheat also. Again, it's quite a, uh, a common plant in our world, but it's such a useful plant to us, such an edible plant, that we don't find it invasive. Cattle are the same thing. Uh, interestingly, in New Zealand, they do go wild and become invasive, but I don't believe that they're, they're invasive here. So invasive depends as well on where you are. Things that are invasive to BC may not be invasive somewhere else. So what is it that makes a species invasive? First of all, there are some characteristics that make things invasive. And the first is that they produce a lot of offspring. 
This one here is purple loose, loose strife. And this single plant can produce 300,000 seeds on an annual basis. That's a huge number of seeds. Uh, so if you get a lot of those germinating, you're just going to turn into a, a massive area of purple loose strife pretty quickly. This little guy here is uh, zebra mussel. This thing is about the size of my thumbnail, and it can produce a million babies each per year. So again, just a huge number of, of offspring. Another characteristic is that they spread easily and effectively. Um, golden retrievers don't necessarily spread e uh, effectively, but on the ear of that dog is a burdock seed. Now that is the, the Velcro-like seed of the burdock plant, and that has grabbed a ride on something that's going to take it far from its parent plant. So you can see that that seed is grabbed onto that dog, and at some stage in the future it's going to drop off and it's going to have a chance to germinate in a whole new place. This one here is Himalayan balsam, also known as touch me not, um, or policeman's helmet. The reason why it's known as touch me not is because when its seed pods are um, ripe and ready to sp spread their seeds, a single touch or even a gust of wind can make them explode and throw their seeds up to 10 meters. This one here is Russian thistle. Again, the se this plant produces a lot of seeds, 200,000 in in on an annual basis. And then as it comes to the end of the season, it's got its seeds encased in its, its main body, and the body breaks off and becomes a tumbleweed. That tumbleweed can travel with the wind for many, many um, metres or, or even a kilometre or so, um, and it's spreading those seeds the whole way. So some examples of how well these things can spread. Another characteristic is that they can really easily establish. This is Japanese knotweed, also known as false bamboo. And this plant can actually grow from a fragment as small as a pea. And now that's not just the seed that grows, but any part of the plant, piece of root or piece of stem, can actually grow into a whole new plant. So it can very easily establish in a new place. This one here is a fully submerged plant. This is Eurasian water milfoil. Again, this plant, if a little piece breaks off through wind action or through dispersal by boats or swimming, um, this plant can, can form a whole new plant from one small fragment. Another characteristic of invasive plants is that they usually lack natural predators. So they typically left their predators back behind where they came from. And this one here is spotted knapweed. It has a really nasty bitter taste. So it's actually unpalatable to most livestock or wildlife. This one here is leafy spurge. Now leafy spurge actually has a milky latex sap and that sap is actually really toxic and really irritating. So if it gets on the mouths of animals or into their gut system, it can cause quite significant problems for them. Um, so they typically avoid it, like the plague. So they spread easily, they grow fast, they invade new areas. But why is it that we care about it? Some of us might be just really environmentally friendly, but there are other reasons too. Typically, these have significant negative impacts. That's why we're concerned about them. They can impact all sorts of parts of our lives. Um, so they can impact property and lifestyle. This one here is a European fire ant. It has a very nasty bite, and it lives in big groups like most ants. <laughs> um, it can actually form quite high densities in, in your backyard. So you can have uh, colonies after colonies after colonies in your backyard, and that can actually make it pretty much impossible to go in your backyard because everywhere you step, these guys come and they attack you. Um, this one's actually been known to reduce property values. Because basically, if you've got these in your backyard, you, uh, you don't have a backyard that you can, you can sell. <laughs> uh, this one here is knotweed. Knotweed has the capability of growing through concrete, pushing its way through asphalt, and it tends to really enjoy going and finding your septic system and damaging that also. So um, it can actually cause problems for your house foundations. It can, like I say, damage your septic systems. And there have been cases where it has caused significant neighbour disputes because it will uh, grow across boundaries. So it's not as if you have it in your place and it's not going to cross your boundary. It's going to go across your boundary. Um, there's been places in the UK where uh, neighbours have actually gone to court over this um, and it's becoming, becoming more of a problem. So it can also cause environmental impacts. Uh, this here is an image of um, a meadow that would once have been a place that was um, full of variety, different plants that were food for different kinds of insects and animals. Now it is just a monoculture of orange hawkweed. 
orange hawkweed is one of those very unpalatable species. There's not much that eats it. Um, and unfortunately, this is now pretty much an empty cupboard. There's no, uh, no food there for most um, of the wildlife that we have. It can also be more direct um, environmental impacts. This is an ancient murrelet, the bird there. Um, these birds are ground nesting seabirds. They live on some of the offshore islands, which typically don't have ground based predators. Unfortunately, um, rats have arrived on a lot of these islands, and rats are quite happy to actually predate on young birds, nestlings, um, and will eat the eggs as well. So they are, are capable of completely decimating these ground nesting seabird colonies. Um, these plants and, and animals can also have an effect on our recreation. So here's the Eurasian milfoil again. Um, this, this stuff, when it gets into a lake, it clogs up the lake to such a degree that it's actually quite challenging to go boating and actually quite dangerous to go swimming in that area. Um, there's been a case of somebody drowning because they got tangled up in this stuff to such an extent they could not swim out of it. So um, it can actually cause a really big issue with, uh, with you know, some of our beautiful boating and, and swimming lakes. And this little guy has found um, the seeds of a thing called puncture vine. Now, can anyone guess what this does? <laughs> it's very spiky. Um, it basically will uh, put a hole in your bike tire. Actually, anything up to a small truck tire will be punctured by these spikes because they're very strong. Um, fortunately, we don't have it yet in this area. It's in the southern Okanagan and uh, we'd really, really like for it not to ever get here. Um, it does like a drier climate, so we're hopeful that it won't come to Revelstoke, but there are other drier places like Golden, where if somebody was to have one of those seeds on their bike and then was to travel back to this area or Golden, potentially those seeds could transfer and become um, a species in this area. And uh, tell you what, biking when you get a puncture every uh, five minutes is not fun. It can also, of course, puncture the feet of uh, soft-footed animals like dogs and, and of course, humans. Um, there are also impacts to domestic animals and wildlife. This one here is burdock. Um, burdock is the one with the hooked seeds that we saw on the golden uh, retriever earlier. This is what it does if a bat or, or a bird contacts these seeds. Imagine if you're only that small and you could actually uh, touch something like Velcro. Essentially, they get immobilized and, and that's it. They can't go forward in their life. Um, it actually also irritates the uh, oops. it also irritates the um, the eyes of cattle and and horses, um, and then whirling disease, which is actually a microbe um, and can be spread through aquatic mud, um, can affect our wildlife in, in the form of damaging, destroying fish populations. So this is um, I think a, a salmon, and you can see it's pretty deformed, and that is actually the the result of the whirling disease microbe entering this, this fish through its skin and causing these dam this damage. Um, it also affects the brain of the fish. The fish starts to swim in circles, which is why it's called whirling disease, and shortly thereafter the fish dies. And this will affect salmon, trout, and whitefish, so all the salmonid species. Zebra and quagga mussels. Um, these guys, let actually show you what they look like. There's actually four inside this tiny little block. <laughs> so they're not very big, but they attach to um, any, any, any structure under the water. And you can see these pipes in here. What's actually happened to these pipes is that they've been submerged for either one month, two months, three months, or six months. After six months of being submerged, the zebra and quagga mussels will attach to this pipe to, to a degree where they've actually clogged the pipe up. So just think for a moment, if we were to put all of the pipework in British Columbia and then we'd have to take it out every six months to declog it, how much that would cost. So there's just a huge economic significance to this one. They might impact our food production. In the front there you've got some invasive field bindweed. This is affecting a crop of wheat and there's two effects here. One is that the production of the wheat is lower and the other is that the use of herbicide has to be higher. So we want to avoid that if we can. Uh, in the second picture there, loss of uh, traditional uh, food and medicinal plants for First Nation people. A lot of First Nations gather a lot of their food from wild places. And if those places have been invaded by invasive species, then they lose areas of production too. And lastly, 
they can actually impact our health pretty nasty. This is a nasty little photo. Um, but this plant here, the tall white flowered plant there, is giant hogweed. It's really similar to our native cow parsnip. The cow parsnip's about my height. And this stuff, as you can see, is kind of twice as tall. And it has a thing called phototoxic sap. Now, phototoxic sap means that if you get the sap on your skin and then you go in the sunlight, you get third degree burns. <laughs> so these images here are of the third degree burns developing over a few days. And then that last one there, five months later, that person is still suffering from the scarring. It's all the same leg, yeah. Burns typically do grow, and it's, it's, it's very much a burn, not just a bit of sunburn. Yeah, so it's a pretty nasty reaction. So I want to just go through a few of our high-priority invasive species. Um, this one here is, uh, we've talked a little bit about it before, it's knotweed. It's known as false bamboo because you can see it's got those very bamboo-like stems. And there's a picture of it pushing its way through a brick wall and pushing through out, um, uh, asphalt. Um, it grows extremely fast up to eight centimetres a day in the spring. So in the first six weeks of spring, it gets about as tall as I am. Not very tall, I know, but. <laughs> um, and the, the bottom picture there is actually of where knotweed was cleared from the site of a new house build. And they scraped off all the knotweed. They thought they got, they got rid of it. They built a new house. And six months later, the knotweed was actually coming up through the floorboards. Now, what happens with knotweed is that it's mostly underground. It's a bit like an iceberg. So what you can see above ground is only a fraction of the actual plant that's there. And they thought they'd got rid of it, but in fact, they just topped it. You wouldn't build your house on top of a half-grown tree. <laughs> that's what they'd done. Um, they actually had to deconstruct that home and start all over again once they'd removed the knotweed. So that one's quite a significant uh, problem plant. This one is Himalayan balsam. Um, we have quite a lot of this in town. This one really likes to have its feet in any wet, water, watery place. This is the one with the annual, uh, an annual plant with the exploding seed pods. And because it likes to be in creeks, it tends to clog those creeks up. Um, each one of the, those plants, so each little um, sort of six foot tall, slim plant can have 700 seeds on it. And those seeds will form just a dense carpet of these plants, changing the way that the water moves in, this, in, the, in the creek. Um, it also actually produces a, a very, very sweet nectar, which is much sweeter and more attractive than most of our native plants. And it seems like a great thing if you happen to have bees, but in fact what it does is it attracts those pollinators away from a lot of our native plants. This one here is Scotch broom. Um, this is a shrubby, woody shrubby plant. It's native to Europe and North America. And as with many of these plants, this was introduced as an ornamental. It's got a beautiful smell. It's got a yellow pea-like flower, a very pretty plant. Um, but unfortunately, also extremely hard to get rid of. This one is um, a problem on the island. And actually, to the south of us here, we haven't got any yet that we know of in town. So if you see this one, please let us know. Um, where I'm from in New Zealand, this is one of our major problems. It takes over whole areas. Just just whole areas um, of this plant. This one here is uh, leafy spurge. Uh, leafy spurge is the one with the toxic milky sap, and it can actually drive its roots eight meters into the ground. I'm not saying eight feet there, I'm saying eight meters into the ground. Um, it's extremely hard to get rid of in any way other than with a, uh, um, with a herbicide. And it can actually, that uh, toxic nature of itself it can actually create a toxin in the soil which prevents other plants from germinating beside it. So it's just another way of outcompeting its, uh, its neighbours. And that milky latex can actually cause serious internal injury to animals. Field scabious is another invasive plant. Um, this one is really recognisable with its trident shape. So it's got a single stem that splits into three and splits into three again. Um, again, lots and lots of seeds for this plant and very difficult to get rid of once established. Yellow flag iris is a riparian plant. Um, this one likes to grow just right on the, on the edges of, of waterways and, uh, and lakes. Um, and this one actually has, what it, one of the things that it does is it prevents wildlife moving from the water to the shore. And the way that it does that is that it outcompetes the cattails. Now cattails, a native plant, it has a, a circular stem, 
and it's quite easy to push through those, those stems. This plant forms a fan-like stem, and it's actually when you get lots and lots of those stems fanning together, they create an impenetrable barrier for things like turtles and, and uh, waterfowl. It also doesn't provide any food for waterfowl, and it doesn't provide any nesting material for waterfowl. So it's generally just really not nearly as good as cattails. Um, and it's very hard to remove. This is purple loosestrife. So this is the one that has 300,000 seeds per plant, um, otherwise known as the swamp monster because that's what it does. It takes over an area of wetland and creates a not very pleasant swamp. It actually changes the water flows in those swamps and can create more in the way of mosquito habitat. So it can be uh, damaging in that way too. Marsh plume thistle, for uh, anyone who's interested in forestry, this is a big concern. This is a, a thistle which is a little taller than me and it loves to be in wet um, meadows. Um, unfortunately, it tends to proliferate in cut blocks. So if you have a slightly damp um, cut block, then these plants will grow up so fast in there that they'll actually outcompete the seedlings. And typically what happens is that they grow really tall and then in the winter the snow pushes them down and the seedlings get pushed down too and then they won't grow ahead. Um, this one's blueweed. Again, it's toxic to livestock. It actually has fiberglass bristles on it that are, are uh, pretty nasty, so pulling this plant is a little bit like, um, you know, touching that nasty fiberglass, you get that prickle. Um, this plant also hosts several diseases for things like uh, wheat and tobacco plants. And if you're thinking that just a couple of those would be really nice. With invasive plants, you never get just a couple. Um, with pretty much all of these plants, they will proceed towards a monoculture. So um, I've actually seen this one in seed packets um, being sold, and you sort of think, well, you know, it's a really pretty flower, and I can see why people might choose it. But unfortunately, what happens is you end up with an, an, an you know, environmentally engulfing plant taking over. And there's just another example, this one's leafy spurge. And the whole hillside is leafy spurge. There's pretty much nothing left except leafy spurge. None of that's edible. And just in case you're thinking it's all about plants, it's not. <laughs> I've got a little example to show you. This is an American bullfrog. So uh, we are here on the continent of North America. But this guy is only from the east. Never made it across the Rockies without human help. Um, so it was originally brought onto this side of the Rockies as a farmed animal for uh, when we like to eat frog's legs. Unfortunately, not enough people like to eat frog's legs and somebody let some go. <laughs> so this is the distribution now on the island. Um, there's quite a lot of areas that are completely infested with this, this animal. It's also into the Kootenays, um, spreading north into BC from the, Uni from the United States. Um, this is actually a really small one. It's, uh, it's the biggest one they could get in a jar, <laughs> small jar. They grow about as big as a small cat. Oh. Yeah, and their mouths are about that wide when they're full grown, a big sized one, and pretty much anything that can fit in their mouth is something they'll eat. So they'll eat other frogs, um, salamanders and newts. They'll eat, um, uh, they'll eat their own young. <laughs> they'll even eat uh, ducklings and things. So once you have bullfrogs infesting a pond, you typically don't have much else. I do actually have a bullfrog call. Um, <clears throat> we don't think we have any bullfrogs in the, this region as, as yet, um, but I'm gonna play a call to you. If you guys hear this sound, I would like you to actually get in touch with us. Hopefully you can hear this. really distinctive. So that's a really distinctive sound and if you do happen to hear that, it's quite different from most other frog sounds, if you do happen to hear that, please get in touch with CSIS immediately. Um, okay, zebra and quagga mussels. Um, what I would like to do is show you again, this is what they look like. Little tiny guys, about the size of a dime at their fullest, full size. Um, not to be confused with our native mussels. So the things to think about with these invasive mussels is that they're in fresh water, they cling to substrate. 
Um, and if you see a muscle that's floating free on the substrate, it's just sitting in the mud or anything, especially if it's a little bit bigger, then it's probably one of the native muscles. And actually some of those native muscles are endangered, so please leave those ones be. <laughs> if you see muscles on a freshwater lake and they're clinging to something, again, that's something I'd really like you to get in touch with us about. I'm going to show you guys a little bit of a video, give my mouth, my uh, voice a little bit of a break. The beauty of British Columbia's lakes and rivers is unparalleled. Those of us who live here, we know this. But something threatens to invade BC that would destroy our fresh water forever. Zebra and quagga mussels. They're an invasive species from Russia. They got into the Great Lakes by accident in the 1980s. By hitchhiking on boats, they've spread through much of eastern and southern North America. They completely decimate every lake or river they enter, and there's no way of getting rid of them. In the fall of 2014, I set out to learn more. Zebra mussels and quagga mussels are cousins. They're a clinging mussel, and they, they coat structures. And they can actually coat it so that they're attaching themselves to the dead layer inside, so the layer can actually end up being something like six inches thick. The impact on the lake is catastrophic. Then, because they're producing all this liquid feces, you get these blue-green algae blooms, which can cause skin rashes or harm your pets. They eat all the food out of the water that the fish would normally get. So basically what you get is a lake full of polluted water and zebra mussels and nothing else. So we're talking about a very real impact to the fisheries. Those fisheries are already straining and invasive mussels are just about the last thing they need. So the mussels are an environmental disaster, but they're also costly to infrastructure, business and individuals. Cost in North America so far, over $5 billion. The effect that the mussels would have on our tourism industry, on our property values. What it would cost BC Hydro to retrofit their facilities to have a maintenance program, it's literally tens of millions of dollars. What does that mean? Our power costs are going to go up. Nestled in the western Kootenays is the town of Christina Lake. Like many communities in BC, it is intimately connected to its lake and river. As you look behind me, you see Christina Lake in the winter, but in the summer, there isn't a place on there that doesn't have a boat, a body, or someone having fun and playing in that water. I was born and raised here. I can't imagine this lake affected with the mussel issue. This lake means everything to this community. It's why we're all here. This happens if these mussels get into this area. Um, we won't be able to go backwards on it. And from here, it could go anywhere and Derby destroy our province. Then, in early 2015, I traveled to Arizona, a state that sees many visitors from BC. At Lake Mead, quagga mussels were discovered in 2007. I didn't anticipate the problem would be this big. The rate that they took over the lake, they just exploded in one year, just from one basin, clear to all of Lake Mead and all of Lake Mojave. Lake Mead, as a boater, I'm on Lake Mead, and the infestation is immense. Every, every dock structure, every boat, every line, every rope piece of rope in the water, that they colonize everything. The only thing that we can do here in BC about zebra and quagga mussels is try to prevent them from coming in. This is not a thing you can be reactive with. You must be proactive because there isn't a second chance once you get infested with quagga mussels. It's now spring, and another boating season fast approaches. As of a year ago, zebra mussels have been found in Lake Winnipeg, and there have been several close calls in BC already. We all need to take responsibility and clean, drain, and dry our boats and anything else that's been in the water. That said, all it would take is one contaminated boat to infest all of British Columbia. So what do we do? If there's one solution that British Columbia could enact, it would be considering the borders as a place where all boats, large boats coming in, get checked. We need to be putting our resources and stopping it at those border crossings so that they don't ever come to our lake, to the Okanagan lakes, to the lakes in the Kootenays. And we need to do it quickly. 
wait. We can't wait a week, we can't wait a month, we can't wait a year. We need to start this now. We would lose our water quality, we'd lose our beach quality, we'd lose our habitat values, we'd mess up all of our infrastructure. Let's not wait five years and look back and say, we could have done this, why didn't we stop it? The only thing that will truly protect BC is mandatory, permanent inspection stations at all of our border crossings. And the only way that's going to happen is if we all speak out, call, or email the Premier, the Minister of Environment, or your local MLA, and tell them you want immediate action on this issue. We have so much to lose. Uh, border inspection stations now, and those of you who have been outside of uh, BC this summer and have come back in will have seen the boat inspection stations near our borders. Um, we have been checking for uh, inf infested um, boats and in fact several boats that were infested with cl clogger and zebra mussels have been found and stopped at those uh, border st stations. So we're moving forward with that. There's always more that can be done um, but we're definitely moving forward with that. So I'm just going to move on a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change. Uh, that's a hot topic a lot of the time. Um, what's that going to mean for invasive species? Um, well, first of all, we have to figure out what sort of change we're likely to see in this area. And there's been some quite good modelling done to look at predictions for what sort of climate changes we're going to see in the next 50 years in this area. And we're likely to see reduced snowpack, increased drought, um, early spring and um, a late, late frost season, um, and of course more high intensity events things like fire and flood and windstorms, which we've seen enough this year. <laughs> um, so the impacts of climate change on native plants, uh, typically they're going to probably cause lower survival of those native plants. Roots are going to be exposed to the cold when they're used to being under a heavy snowpack. Uh, a lot of our plants are not uh, adapted to deal with low water situations and so they're going to have a hard time surviving those drought. Um, and also predators like the mountain pine beetle, which we've seen explode in the last 10 years, are going to continue to explode more and more as the climate becomes more uh, available to them in these northern latitudes. So what's going to happen with invasives? Well, invasives, as we've already seen, are highly adaptable. That's why they're invasive. Um, that's only going to suit them to have the climate changing. They often have an early spring and a late fall growth spurt because they're, um, that's part of their adaptability. They tend to have a broader range of climatic uh, survivability anyway than our native plants. So all of these factors are going to increase, uh, probably make them, them um, have a, an easier time of surviving here. And also the potential range that most of these invasive species currently have is only going to expand north and higher in elevation. There are likely to be more of these high intensity events and those tend to favour more adaptable organisms. Um, there's also going to be an increase in disturbed areas, which are often those places that are ripe for invasion. So they're a, a spearhead of invasion into a new area. So it's going to be complex to determine what's going to happen as far as climate change goes when in invasive species are thrown in the mix. And it's hard to predict whether it's going to be harmful or helpful. But my belief is that in most cases, it will be more likely that uh, invasive species will just survive a bit better. So, first of all, we've talked about invasive species, what they are and why they matter. And then I just want to talk a little bit about how they actually get here. How do they invade these new places? Why didn't this happen 2,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago? Well, they had to ride with us. 6,000 years ago, we weren't moving around a lot, but now we do. Um, this is actually the distribution of common tansy across BC. It's kind of a strange picture if you look at it. It's got these funny stripes in it. You don't know what those stripes are? Not rivers. Those are roads. Those are highways. And you can see just from where the plants are, where those highways are. And you can see that those plants are moving along highways. And then we have a look at this picture. This is the global human transportation system quite the picture. There's an awful lot of transportation that we do. We're moving ourselves around, we're moving a whole lot of products around, we're moving all sorts of things. Um, we're not quite in the middle of everything, but we're still in our little area, there's still an awful lot of transport going on. So when we look at invasive species, we're going to look at the pathways of invasion. This is the thing that we can do to prevent the spread of invasive species. We need to look at it as a pathway and we need to find ways to, sh to, to shut down that pathway of invasion. 
Can we change our behaviour to change the invasion of invasive plants and animals? Yes, we can. So when you're out camping or hiking or out with your dog, <laughs> poor little dog, um, or four-wheel driving, these are all examples of where you could in, um, inadvertently be carrying seeds around for invasive plants. Um, I actually have with me here a little brush that I carry one of these in my car and <coughs> excuse me, when I'm going to a place that I'm going to play in the environment, I always go with clean gear. And when I've played in the environment, I brush down my gear before I leave. So I come clean and I leave clean. Play, clean, go. Here's uh, examples of mountain biking and, of course, muddy boots, which can also transport seeds. Um, I don't know if any of you in the room could identify all the seeds of these invasive plants. I certainly couldn't. <laughs> but I know that if I've got a clump of mud on my bike or on my boot, it's probably got some seeds in there and there's a good chance some of them are invasive. So all we need to do is clean down our boots and bike and other gears um, before we leave that muddy trail. Um, check our vehicle and remove any seeds and mud. And if you really like a flower on the roadside and you really want to carry it home, make sure it goes in the garbage when you're done with it because those flowers can actually contain seeds and we don't want to be putting them in our compost and making sure we've got invasive plants in our garden from there, from there on. So another thing that was mentioned in that muscle threat video was clean and drain and dry your boat. Um, obviously the boat there on the left has got lots of weeds hanging off it. Those weeds would grow if they were put into a new lake. So it's really, really important to clean off all the mud and plants and debris off any water toys that you've got. It's also really important to make sure there's no water standing left in your boat. And that includes the water inside the, the, the engine cooling system or in the bilges anywhere, even in the bottom of your kayak. Um, kayaks are boats too. Please see them as, as water toys that has to be clean and drained and dried. Um, any water toys, anything that's been in the water needs to be cleaned and drained and dried. Um, people who are interested in fishing. The, uh, the fishing gear also needs to be clean and, and, um, and free of any sort of mud or any sort of standing water. Uh, the guy standing there in his waders, those waders are often felt so sold and they actually carry mud really effectively. And I don't know if you remember, but the mud in those, on those waders could be carrying the spores of the whirling disease. So if you're a fisher person and you've got mud on your boots and you go from one stream to another, you could be carrying that whirling disease from one stream to another. Um, also, if you like fishing, it's really important not to throw fish entrails down your garburetor and in your sink. Really important that those have got to go in the garbage because the spores of the whirling disease can survive a septic system. So if they go down the garburetor, they're going straight into the septic system and then they're going out into the next stream. Always put them in the garbage. So take action to clean, drain and dry. Um, clean and drain and dry all the plants, animals, mud, everything off your boat. Drain it onto dry land and then make sure everything is fully dry before it goes into the next lake. Um, and this is just a map of where those inspection stations were this summer um, and the government is, is definitely making progress on making sure that those stations are catching as many of the boats as they go through as possible. The one in Golden actually was operating for 24 hours a day throughout the summer. So I've got some pictures of really pretty plants here. Those of you who are gardeners, be plant wise. When you're planting a garden, uh, a plant in your garden, when you're choosing one, um, make sure it's not something that's invasive. These ones here are all invasive and actually they're often um, still sold. The bachelor's buttons on the left here is commonly sold in seed packs in, uh, in a lot of the different stores. We're working really hard with the um, garden centres <coughs> to reduce the number of invasive plants that are sold in garden centres, but you can actually help too by providing feedback. If you go into a garden centre and you're looking for some plants, ask them, is this an invasive plant or is this not invasive? If they don't know, don't buy it. If they do know, that's great, but they've also gotten the message that you don't want to buy invasive plants. Um, wildflower seed mixes are often full of invasive plants. Uh, it's still a wildflower if it's from somewhere other than here. <laughs> Might be a whole bunch of wildflowers from Europe, a lot of which are invasive. Um, this particular here, picture here has got the bachelor buttons right in the front. Um, and if you're going to put wildflower seed mixes in, then choose seeds that you know are native to BC or are ones that are not on the invasive species list. Um, often people who are trying to sell wildflower seed mixes 
They choose things that germinate easily, grow fast, and reproduce really easily. Those are the characteristics of invasive plants. Picture says it all, really. Can you relate? <laughs> I know I've bought plants in the past which have taken me hostage, and uh, I think it's a, a good uh, choice not to do that. So be plant-wise. Help identify invasive plants in your garden. And we actually have a couple of resources. One of them is a paper resource, which you guys can take home from here. This is the Grow Me Instead. It's got pictures of plants that are invasive and some um, alternates that you can choose instead. And then for those of you who have iPhones or uh, Androids, we actually have an app. I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is an app that actually shows you all the invasive plants and animals in BC. You can download it free on your phone or, iP or um, iPad. And this will tell you each and every plant that's invasive, so you can always choose uh, ones that are not invasive. Sorry. Um, it is called the PlantWise app. And there's a, actually there's two. One of them is just the PlantWise app, and the other one is the Invasive Species uh, Report Invasives app. And you can actually go to the, the app store and look for PlantWise, or the other one is uh, Report Invasives BC. So another pathway of invasion for invasives is that they sometimes will be um, entering the environment as unwanted pets. Um, these, this one here is not a western painted turtle, that's a red-eared slider, which is very closely related, but is actually a different species. And then koi carp and pretty much all the goldfish, um, and a lot of different uh, invasive species can be uh, pets. So the title there says it all, don't let it loose. Make sure that you're able to look after a pet before you choose to buy one. Never release animals or plants into the wild, and that includes the water plants in your fish, fish tank or aquarium. And um, return your pet to the store if you can't look after it. So spread the word and not the seeds. Report strange animals or plants to, to CSIS. And use this app. This is the app I was talking about before. Um, so it's Report Invasives BC on the App Store. And you can actually then go in and look at all the different categories of invasive uh, species and choose to have a look at them. And anyone's welcome to have a look at my iPad afterwards to see what it looks like. So thank you to our sponsors, um, Columbia Basin Trust, Basin Species Council, the CSRD, and, excuse me, and the province, of <laughs> and the province. I think my voice has just about lasted to the end. <laughs> thank you, and are there any questions? and um, if you're interested in more workshops, you can sign up for our newsletter and learn about other free workshops in the area. And I'm just going to pass around an evaluation sheet if you have time to just drop it off in the back so you can um, get feedback on how to improve um, our information. Okay. Thanks, Sue. If anyone's got any questions, I'll uh, do my best to make my voice last a few more minutes. Yeah. Um, the question was how many of the species that I showed you were uh, are in our region? Um, we actually have resources where we um, have a list the, of, of plants that are in our region and those that are not in our region but we're um, actively looking to make sure that we are on it straight away if we do see them. Pretty sure that everything I showed in there was actually already in our region, um, except the bullfrogs of course and the quagga mussels. Zebra and quagga mussels are not yet here in BC and the bullfrogs are not in the Columbia Shoe Swap area. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of whether all of the plants were or not. Um, maybe one or two are not in there. But you can find res resources on our website to, uh, to find out which ones are actually in the region and which are not. Yep. Excuse me. The, just a question whether the tumbleweed that you see in Kamloops is native or invasive. I believe that that's mostly Russian thistle, but I'm not sure Robin might yeah. be able to answer that one. depend that we have to look at it but there are a lot of invasive tumbleweeds in that area yeah any other questions thank you very much for coming through that and to robin as well 